Um, welcome to NYU, welcome to C-Splash, to Courant. My name's Ernie Davis. I teach here in the computer science department. Uh, so what I want to do today is to talk about projective geometry. And I'm going to, the way we're going to, the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to show you, uh, begin by showing you a beautiful theorem, which is known as Pappus's theorem. And uh, then we're going to create a projective geometry, and we're going to use projective geometry to prove Pappus's theorem. So first of all, Pappus's theorem is as follows. You draw two lines, one, two, and you draw three You draw, uh, on each line, you draw three uh, points of three different colors. So we'll have red, blue, and green. Pink. Red. Blue. Green. Red, blue, green. And now you connect the points of different colors. So, and you mark the points where the, the same color pairs cross. So red to blue here crosses red to blue there, and we'll mark that with purple. And then red to green here. Crosses red to green there. And again, we'll mark that with purple. And then blue to green. Here. Crosses blue to green. Here. And we'll mark that with purple. And then up to the accuracy of this kind of mechanism, these three purple lines, these three purple points, are collinear. Okay, and let me show you some more examples. So draw two lines, red, green, and blue points on each line, connect all points of different colors, mark the three crossing points, and they are collinear. So more another example, I hope this is visible. Uh, here is red, blue, and green, and here is blue, green, and blue, red, and green. So they don't have to be in the same order. You do the construction again, one of the crossing points lies outside rather than in the middle, but that's okay. They're still collinear. Or here, uh, you have blue, green, red, and red, blue, green, and all of the points lie outside, and they're still collinear. And here the lines cross, uh, the original lines cross, red, blue, green, red, blue, green, the crossing points are here, here, and here, and they're still collinear. Okay, now this is a remarkable theorem in, in many ways, but one way is that it only, if you'll notice, it only has to do with points lying on lines. And there are no distances, there are no angles, there's not even a right angle. So you can draw it with a straight edge, which I just did, without any compass. And this is, if you think about the theorems you've learned in geometry class, uh, probably none of them were like that. 
they all involve distances or angles or something of the kind, implicitly or explicitly. So circles implicitly involve some, is, a, is a shape of constant distance, for instance. Uh, and this is the, essentially the simplest non-trivial theorem which only involves uh, points lying on lines. So, uh, first of all, who was Pappus? Pappus was a uh, Pappus of Alexandria was a mathematician who lived in the early 300s in Alexandria. Uh, and he was pretty much the last great mathematician of classical antiquity. We don't otherwise know my, very much about him. Um, and so how do you prove Pappus' theorem? Well, one way is to set the whole thing up using analytic geometry, coordinate geometry. And you can do that. And uh, many years ago, I tried to do that by hand unsuccessfully. You get this enormous collection of terms, I don't know, 50 or odd terms. And if you do it right, they all cancel and go to zero. And it proves the collinearity. But it's not easy to do it right. And when you've done it, it doesn't tell you anything very much unless you analyze it really carefully. That's not how Pappus invented it because, among other things, because he lived 1,300 years before coordinate geometry, he had a rather complicated uh, geometric proof involving uh, relations between the lengths of the lines involved. OK, what, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to show you is a proof uh, in, from projective geometry. And this is going to be very indirect. We're going to start out with things, talking about things that seem First of all, very strange, and second of all, to have nothing at all to do with Pappus's theorem. And we're going to develop the theory of projective geometry for a while. And then once we've developed it enough, the proof of Pappus's theorem turns out to be really simple. Um, and projective geometry is a theory which has its origins in the late, just for the historical setting again, for the, it has its origins in the late 17th century. Uh, and then it really became very popular in the 19th and early 20th century. And now it's, it's, it's somewhat less in vogue, but it's still, still, I like it a lot. Many people like it a lot. OK, so this is where we're going. Uh, first of all, I'm going to define something called the projective plane, which is the ordinary Euclidean chain plane with one new line of points added to it. Uh, Second of all, I'm going to talk about the process of projecting from one plane to another. And first, we're going to talk about projecting between ordinary planes. And then we're going to talk about uh, projecting between um, two projective planes. And I'll show you that the theory of projecting between two projective planes is much nicer. It works out much more neatly than pro uh, projecting between two ordinary planes. Then we'll prove Pappus's theorem. That will be quick. And then, in time permitting, I'll talk a little bit about perspective in art, which is related. Uh, and then about point line duality, which is the amazing fact that in the projective plane, you can turn all the points into lines and all the lines into points, and nothing has changed. You still have the projective plane. OK, so we're going to start out with the projective plane uh, with the following rather silly uh, observation, which is that Euclidean geometry of the standard kind is unfair and it's lopsided, in the sense that any two points are connected by a line. And almost any pair of lines meet in a point. But it's not quite true, because parallel lines don't meet in a point. And this is, this is not as symmetric as one would wish, so we're going to fix this. So uh, we're going to fix this as follows. I'm going to define a sheaf of parallel lines is just all the lines that are parallel to one another. Or to one another. So these are five lines from the same sheaf. They all go in this direction. So this is, um, this is a sheaf together with all the other lines parallel to these. So obviously, every line in the plane belongs to exactly one sheaf, all the lines that are parallel to it. OK, now what I'm going to say is if you have a sheaf of parallel lines, 
I'm going to say that we're going to add one new point for that sheaf, and that point is going to be called the point at infinity for the sheaf, and we're going to say that all the lines in that sheaf contain the point. So if you take any of these lines, um, right, you have this sheaf of lines, then they, uh, they all go out to infinity and they all contain that same point, which obviously isn't there, it's way out there, and it's also the identical point is way in this direction. You go either direction on this sheaf of lines, you come out with the same point at infinity. There's only one point at infinity. For each sheaf, there's not two. And so if you go, what you can do is you can go out to the point and then you cycle back if you continue going. All right, so this, how do I, how do I know that this makes any sense? Well, hopefully by the time we're finished, you'll be convinced that this is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, in the, for the time being, just sort of give me a suspension of disbelief. Um, trust, I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'll, I will borrow a little uh, credit from you in, in the sense of belief and hopefully pay it back by the time we're done. Okay, so. That's a point at infinity, and now all the points at infinity lie together on a line. So we're going to create one line, which is the line at infinity. There's one line that the line at infinity contains all the points at infinity. And the projective plane is the regular plane plus the line at infinity. Okay, and so now we have fixed our problem. Uh, it is the case that every pair of points u and v is connected by a single line. And we have to check three, there are three cases. One is that u and v are regular points on the plane. Okay, so there, there we know there are any two points in the plane are connected by a line, that's fine. Second case is that one of them is an ordinary point and the other one, v, is a point, uh, point at infinity. Well, if it's a point at infinity, it lies on some sheaf and so there's a parallel line, right? You have this point of infinity here, V, which corresponds to this sheaf, and you have uh, a point U here, uh, which is in the regular plane. And so what we do is we just construct the line from the sheaf, the line parallel to all those, which goes through U, uh, and then by definition it contains V, because that's what we mean by a point at infinity lying on a line, is that the line is part of the sheaf. Okay, so that's case two. And then case three is that U and V are both points at infinity, uh, and in that case they lie at the line at infinity because of what the line of infinity is. Okay, so that shows that now every pair of points is connected by a line, so that's good. Uh, we haven't wrecked that, and we have to show also, we want to show also, of course, now, which was our objective, that every pair of lines is connect, uh, meet in a point. Okay, so if any L and M are any two lines, then they meet in a single point. And there's, again, three cases. One is L and M are ordinary lines but aren't parallel. Well, then they meet in a point uh, in the plane. They don't meet at a point at infinity because they're not parallel. The second case is that they're ordinary lines and they are parallel. Well, in that case, they meet at the corresponding point of infinity because that's how we set up our point to infinity. And the third case is that L is an ordinary line and that M is the line at infinity. And in that case, they meet at the point on the line of infinity which corresponds to the sheaf for L. So we've got it all, every, all this is working. So now we have any pair of points determine a line and any pair of lines meet in the point. So that's just nice. However, okay, now let me emphasize that once we've added the uh, line at infinity, um, as far as the projective plane is concerned, there's no difference between the points at infinity and the ordinary points. They're just all points. The, the points at infinity don't know that they're points at infinity the way that you know, the dead people in the sixth sense don't know that they're dead. Uh, they're just, they consider themselves just points, and if you look at any line that goes through them, well, it can take, it, if, you, if you are a point at infinity, and you are looking at some particular line that goes through you, well, it comes in from this side, and then it goes out from that side, because you, the point at infinity, are also way out there. So lines now are topologically circles. They cycle around. You go out to the point at infinity, and then you come right back 
from the other end. Okay. However, you do pay a price. In fact, you pay a rather large price for moving from the Euclidean uh, plane into the projective plane. Uh, the first thing you have, the first thing you lose is the idea of a distance because there's no reasonable way of defining the distance between, I mean, you can, you can define the distance from an ordinary point to the point at infinity to be infinite if you want. Infinity is a somewhat reasonable number under some circumstances, but there's absolutely no reasonable way, it turns out, of defining the distance between two points at infinity. Um, so, in, in, in a way that works with the ordinary sense of distance. So you lose the idea of distance. Uh, and correspondingly, you lose, you lose the idea of angles because angles, it turns out, are just derived from distances. An even stranger fact is that you lose the idea of betweenness. What does betweenness mean ordinarily? We say B here is between A and C. What that means is if you go on this line from A to C, you will go through B. That's fine, that's well defined in the ordinary Euclidean plane. But in the, pro in the projective plane, it's equally true that if you start at B and you go this way and out to the point at infinity and then back, you can go B to C at the point of infinity back to A. So that way C is between uh, B and A and likewise you can go from B to A out to the point at infinity back to C and so that way A is between B and C. So there's no idea of betweenness anymore either. The projective plane is in fact a non-Euclidean geometry. It's one of the most important of the non-Euclidean geometries. It's not the famous one. The famous one is the one which was discovered by Bolyai Bolya, Bolya and Lobachevsky, um, which only changes the parallel postulate. That's a different uh, non-Euclidean geometry. Um, it's, it's, it's a less radical change in terms of the axiomatization. It's actually a more radical change in terms of some aspects of the geometry. Anyway, it's, it's different. All right, so now we've set up the projective plane. I haven't yet paid back uh, this, uh, uh, this debt of suspension of disbelief, but we've, we've shown that it has some nice properties. Now I want to talk about projection. Okay, projection is the following. You have two planes. One we'll call the source plane, we'll label it S, and the other we'll call the image plane, we'll label that G for the fourth letter in image. Uh, and it turns out it doesn't make any difference which is which. In any given situation, you can call one plane the source and one plane the image or vice versa. It's the same thing, uh, but it's convenient to give them different names. And then you have a focal point. The focal point F is any point which isn't on either S or G. Um, and then we define a function which maps points in S to points in G and if you have a point x in S, then the projection of x onto G is the P of sub f of G of x is the point where the line from f to x intersects G. So x again is a point on S. I'll show pictures in a minute. Uh, and you draw the connection between x and the focal point and you find where it in the intersects the image plane and that's the image of x. And we have these subscripts, this is, I don't know if you've seen this notation before. What this means is you have a function, but the function depends on particular other things. So this is a, we, we choose initially the focal point, the image, uh, the image plane, and the source plane. And then what the function is depends on, uh, then you have one particular function you're talking about, but it depends on how you chose the focal point and the, and the image point. Okay, so some pictures to show this off. You have this real object here, uh, which is a square, and then you have a glass screen and a focal point E, and you draw the lines from D to E and find where they intersect the screen, and that's D prime, and likewise C prime, A prime, and B prime. And what you get when you project a square onto an, a plane that's at an angle 
is some kind of, uh, is some kind of quadrilateral. Uh, or you can project it onto this screen here with this focal point. Uh, and again, you get, you project each point in the source plane, which is there, onto the image plane, which is pictured here, and you get these four points. Okay? So it's clear how this is working. And of course, you have to imagine this as being in three dimensional because after we've done all this, we've actually projected the whole thing onto the screen, which makes things confusing. Okay, so another example here, this is uh, the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Uh, so here we're projecting a, here this is the source plane and this is the image plane and the focal point is here and they've drawn a, a circle in the source plane. It looks like an ellipse from our point of view because we're looking at the source plane, at a, we ourselves are looking at the source plane from an angle. And they show that if, uh, what this shows is if you, if the line from the focal point to the center of the circle is parallel to the image plane, then what happens to the circle is it turns into a parabola. Uh, sorry, a hyper, uh, into one half of a hyperbola in this case, not a parabola. If the, if the line were parallel to the exact, if the, if the focal point were placed so that it was, the line here was parallel, uh, the line through the top of the circle was parallel to the image plane, then you would get a parabola. And uh, another picture here, we have a source plane with a triangle. We have a focal point where, uh, the, uh, where the line from the focal point to the apex of the triangle happens to be parallel to the image plane. The image plane is here. And what happens is uh, the base of the triangle turns into this line. And then these two uh, lines, which meet at uh, which meet at the apex of the triangle, turn into parallel lines. And perhaps you can see where this is going, because what happens is they are actually going to meet at the point at infinity. This apex of the triangle is projected to the point at infinity for these two parallel lines. Okay, and so, but there is one limitation on all these pictures, and in fact, I, I, I couldn't find online a good picture to illustrate the next point, so I had to draw it myself, and unfortunately, I'm a terrible drawer, uh, so you will have to live with me. But this is a key point, and the key point is that the projection works in both directions. It works in front of the focal focus, and it works behind the focus. So here we have uh, here we have a source plane and a triangle drawn in the source plane, and then the image plane is this large plane down here, and the focal point, uh, the line, the focal point, uh, the, the line parallel to the image plane through the focal point comes out sort of in the center of the circle. Okay, so what happens is that A is projected to a point on this side of the image plane, and then this line uh, going out to B turns into that line there, and um, this line going out to C turns into this line here, and when these, both of these lines hit the line parallel there, the equal in height to the focus, they go out to infinity, and then when you get higher with B itself and C, they project backward into the, uh, into the plane. They're behind the focal point here. And uh, the lines coming down from them go this way and that way. So if you trace A to, to, A to B to C and back to A, and you project that, what happens is you start out with the projection of A, and you go out to B, and you go out to the point at infinity and you come all the way back and then finally reach B. Then you go across this line, that's just this little line here, 
And then you go back from C to A. So you start at C and you go out, out this way. And you go all the way out to be in point at infinity. And you come back here and reach back to A. Question? Yeah. With the one where it was like Carol was sort of when you had the hyperbola, mm -hmm. does the same thing happen? Like yeah, yeah, you get, exactly. You get the other branch of the hyperbola behind it. And they connect, and they connect out in, at infinity, yes. Thank you very much. That's exactly right. OK, so let me talk about pro general properties for projection. We're going to prove some statements. First of all, for any point in the source plane, there is one projection. Point x, there's one projection onto the image plane. It's the point where the line intersects the image plane. So easy. Um, assuming that it does intersect, there's at most one. And likewise, for any point in the image plane, there's at most one point in the source plane, which it comes from, namely the point you draw the point from F to Y uh, and uh, find where it intersects the source plane. If it does intersect the source plane, then that's the only possible point. Because a line and a plane can only intersect in one point. Okay, thirdly. If you have a source, a line in the source plane, then its projection is a line uh, in, the, in the image plane. It turns lines into lines because, um, draw this maybe. You have, let us say, the image plane here. And the source plane here, and the focus here, and a line there. And what you're doing is you're projecting uh, the, consider the projection of this line in the source plane onto the image plane there. Okay, but what, let's, con let's think about this. We'll construct a plane which contains F and which contains the line that we're projecting. Okay, so we'll call that plane P. And then clearly the projection of the line onto the image plane is the intersection of P with G, but the intersection of two planes is a line, so that means that the projection of a line is a line. Okay, and when you project, you preserve the relationship between points and lines x is a point on line L, then the projection of x is a point on the, on the projection of L. It's obvious. That's what one means to project the line. Okay, so what that means is suppose I have a whole diagram of lines and points uh, in the source plane, and I project it now onto the image plane. What I'm going to get is a collection of points and lines which has exactly the same structure as I started with in terms of the intersection. So if you take a Pappus diagram, uh, right, with all these points and lines, and I project it onto an image plane, I get another Pappus diagram. Now, depending on how I choose the focal point in three dimensions, part of the Pappus diagram may be behind me, but that doesn't matter. You'll get these things, these examples like the ones I showed where, um, where the intersection points are outside rather than inside. Uh, but um, but it doesn't matter because, as I said before, there is no concept of betweenness in the projective plane. And therefore, there's no concept of outside and inside. The outside, is, you can't tell the difference. Uh, so, so it works however you do it. Okay. Now, if you have a source and an image plane, and they're not parallel, then there's one line in S which has no projection onto G. Uh, so for instance, uh, let's say the S is, is this side of the, well, we'll do it from the side you can see, this side of the uh, desk and, uh, and G is the floor. Okay, so I claim 
and we'll take, uh, we'll take our focal point to be right here, then uh, most lines in the uh, most lines in the in this plane will project onto the floor one way or another. For instance, this line here will project over there. See it? Uh, but there is, if I have a fixed focal point, there is one line which doesn't project on the floor, namely I draw the line parallel to the floor here through the focal point. Uh, that defines a line in the image plane. You can just imagine this is extending upward, so it's a line in the image plane, but it doesn't intersect the floor because this line is parallel, right? This line from the focal point to any point on the line in the source plane is parallel to the floor. And so that line uh, has no, there's one line in S which has no projection in G. And likewise, there's one line in G which has no projection in S. Uh, namely, uh, if I choose this point, if I choose this point here as my focal point, and I want to construct a line in S which never meets that plane here, well, just I take, uh, I take, the, I, I draw my line from my focal point parallel to the image plane, uh, to the source plane rather, and uh, I construct a line like this in the source plane, and that. Uh, that line doesn't intersect the image plane. Sorry, it doesn't intersect the, the source plane. Okay, so there are these two lines which don't work out well in terms of projection. Uh, one line in the source plane and one line in the image plane, uh, which don't work out well in terms of projection from this particular focal point because the line in the source plane doesn't project to any line in the image plane and vice versa. So I'm going to call these the lonely lines relative, this is in S and G, relative to the choice of the focal point. Okay, so now we're going to fix our notion of projection to include the lonely lines. We're going to take care of the lonely lines. So you might think, ah, I got a lonely line in S, I've got a lonely line in G, I'll just to find the projection to map the lonely line in S to the lonely line in G. Well, that doesn't work because points close to, because we want things to be continuous, and points that are close to the lonely line in S turn out not to be close to the, lone, don't, don't project to something that is close to the lonely line in G and vice versa. What we're going to do instead is we're going to move things up to the projective plane. And we're going to project the lonely line in S to the line infini at infinity in G, and the lonely line in G to the line at infinity uh, in S. So suppose you have, why is the reason to think about it? Suppose, let's go back, we have a sheaf of lines in S, or H, I'll get back to. Um, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Uh, it turns out that the images of H in G actually all do meet at one point, which is on the lonely line of G. And any two different sheaves meet at different points of the lonely line. So what we're going to do is we're going to define the projection of the point of infinity for this sheaf to be the point on the lonely line where the images meet. So that's a lot of verbiage, but it'll be clearer when you see a picture. So this is the source plane, and I've got three different, I've got four different sheaves here, actually, right? There's the sheaf in green, and there's the sheaf in red, and there's the sheaf in blue, and then there's the sheaf in black. And if you view this at an angle, which is the same thing as projecting it onto an image plane, what you get is as follows. The points in green all meet here, the points in red all meet here. The points in blue all meet here. The points in black, the lines in black, I should say. I keep saying points where I meant lines. Uh, the lines in black are still all parallel. They meet at the point of infinity, <laughs> at the point of in inf at infinity. Uh, and of course, the point at infinity is a point on this line because the point that, because this line is parallel to these as well.
Okay, this takes it takes a little proving, but if you if you if you work through the definitions, it's 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 obvious. I'm not going to I'm not going to work through. The, I'm not going to give you the detailed description. If you look if you if you look back through everything we've done and talk figure out sheaves and so on, uh, and what we meant by the lonely line, then this is. Um, this is straightforward. Okay, and it works the same way, uh, vice versa. So if you have a sheaf of lines in G, then the images in S of all these lines meet at one point on the lonely line of S. And so we're going to define the projection of the point in Im of infinity for H in G to be the point uh, on the lonely line of S where the images meet. Okay, so now projection works perfectly for projective planes. So for every point in the projective plane of S, in the source plane, there is one point uh, in the projective plane of G, which is its projection, and vice versa. So the corp matches points to points exactly, with no exceptions. Uh, and it matches lines to lines exactly, with no exceptions. Okay, so now we can pr uh, prove the following. Um, if you have a line in the projective plane of S, then its projection is a line in the projective plane of G. And it's a proof by cases. I don't think I'll take the time to go through all the cases. But if you go through the cases, it's just, um, it's, it's just an enumeration of, it's, 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 it's all follow, each case follows easily from what we've done already. Okay. And then you need now one more fact that if you have any, you can take if you if you if you have any line in the source plane, then we can choose an image plane and a focus uh, in such a way that the line L is going to project onto the line at infinity. Um, that's easy to do. We're going to just choose F to be any point which isn't in the source plane. The choice of F is almost arbitrary, it just has to not be in the source plane. And now uh, construct the plane Q, which uh, contains both F and L. And now choose G to be some other plane, which is parallel to Q. And so uh, since uh, the line, now the line from F to uh, uh, to L is parallel to G, so it doesn't meet G, so it projects to the line at infinity. Okay, and now we can prove practices there. And it's quite simple. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the same Pappus diagram. Uh, and what we're going to do is we've, we've drawn the Pappus diagram. We don't initially know that uh, C is collinear with A and B. That's what we have to prove. Uh, but we set up this diagram. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a projection because of, I'm allowed to do this because of what I just stated a minute ago. I'm going to choose a projection that uh, projects both A and B. It projects the line from A and B to the line at infinity. And what I want to do is to show that C also lies on the line at infinity. And then since uh, projection preserves lines and their intersection relationship, since A, B, and C are collinear after I've projected them, they must be collinear here as well. Okay, so I'm going, I'm going to do it. I'm going to project A and B to the line at infinity, prove that the projection of C, once I've done that, lies on the line at infinity, and um, that shows that C is that shows that C is collinear with A and B in after being projected, but projective preser projection preserves collinearity, so C must be collinear with A and B here as well. Okay, but what does it mean to project a point to the line at infinity? Well, it means that the two lines which intersected in, in the point uh, that intersect in A, once I projected 
uh, a to infinity, it means those two lines are in fact parallel because that's what it means for two points to meet at a point in, in infinity. It means in the usual sense that they're parallel. So we're going to construct this diagram so that the two lines from but connecting the blue and red dots are parallel and the two lines connecting the red and green dots are parallel. And then what we want to prove is that the two lines connecting the blue and green dots are parallel. Okay? But that's easy. That's just a very that's a easy exercise in, in Euclidean geometry. We have now, right, we have the two lines Connecting the blue and red dots are parallel, and the two lines connecting the uh, red and green dots are parallel. So DA is parallel to FC, and EA is parallel to FB, and we want to prove that DB is parallel to EC. But by similar triangles, FX over DX is equal to CX over AX because these two lines are parallel. Those two triangles are similar. Uh, and likewise, fx over ex equals bx over ax. So um, these two lines are parallel, so these two triangles are similar. And now you divide, uh, you divide this, this equation by this equation, you get ex over dx is equal to cx over bx, but that means that um, these to this and that are parallel, and that means, uh, and, and that's, um, and then we're done, right? That's all we had to prove. So, right, we, the, the, the points that we projected out were, uh, we, we projected this, the crossing points to, um, to the lines at infinity, so the point where this crosses that is projected to a point at infinity, the point where this crosses that is projected to a point in infinity, and we showed that the third crossing point is at, at infinity, and we project back, and they must still be collinear. Okay, so we're done with Pappus's theorem. That, I hope that made some sense. Okay, I want to talk briefly about perspective in art because this is, this is one of the motivations um, for how projective geometry was created. Uh, if you look at the li literature on uh, pr perspective in art, you will see references to such things as one-point perspective, two-point perspective, and three-point perspective. It took me a long time to realize what these were mathematically, but they're actually simple. One-point perspective is where the image plane is perpendicular uh, to the x-axis. So you have conceptually the scene out here. This is uh, Christ giving the keys of something or other to St. Peter by Perugino. Uh, and um, you're projecting it onto a plane, which is actually the vertical plane here. Uh, and what happens is that lines that go outward converge. So you can see this line converges, and that line converges, and the people get smaller in the background, which is, of course, what they're supposed to do. Um, so this is one point. Two-point perspectives is where the image plane is parallel to the z-axis but is not necessarily perpendicular to the x-axis. So if you're sort of looking at this here, um, here we have this structure of a base and the top and a couple of windows or whatever it is. And we're looking at it, as you can see, some, from upward down at a sort of angle. Uh, so all these vertical lines remain parallel, they remain perpendicular, but this line here, which is the y-axis, let's say, these two lines are visibly converging to one another. They will meet somewhere out here. Uh, they actually meet at the point of infinity, actually, you know, but if you draw, continue this diagram, they would meet somewhere here. And these two lines in the x-axis are also converging to one another, and they meet somewhere out there. And then three-point perspective is 
where the image plane is not, per, is not parallel to any of the coordinate axes and therefore lines along any of the coordinate axes uh, converge. So here we have a building of a particular shape viewed from a, viewed upward and at an angle. So the lines in the x dimension are converging together and the lines in the y dimension are converging together and the lines in the z dimension are also converging together. Okay, but they're all, uh, from the geometric point of view, these are not very different. They're all essentially the same. It's just a, a question of where you choose the image plane. All right, I have a few more minutes. So I want to show you how this works out algebraically. And we'll prove the point line duality. Okay. So I want to, what I'm going to do is talk about how you take ordinary coordinate geometry for the Euclidean plane and you extend it to work with the projective plane. So let's start with ordinary coordinate geometry for the plane. In ordinate coordinate, ordinary coordinate geometry, a point is a pair of Cartesian coordinates. So 1, 3 is a point in the plane once you've fixed the coordinate system. And an a line is an equation which has the form ax plus by plus c equals 0. I trust you all are familiar with this. Okay, and a, b, and c are constants. So you have 2x plus y minus 5 is 0, uh, is a line. And a point falls on the line if it satisfies the equation. So x equals 2 and y equals 1 is a, is a, satisfies the equation. So the point 2, 1 lies on this line x equals 0 when y equals 5 also satisfies the equation. So 0, 5 lies on this line. x equals 2 and a half and y equals uh, 0 also lies on this line, uh, also satisfies the equation. So that point also lies on this line. This I trust is all. You know this all. Okay, now, of course, it's not a particular line is not one equation. It's any number of equations, and more precisely an infinite number of equations, because you can always multiply the whole equation through by a constant, right? So 2x plus y minus 5 equals 0 is the same equation as 4x plus 2y minus 10 equals 0, and the same equation as 6x plus 3y minus 15 equals 0. Those are all the same line because they all are satisfied by the same set of points. Okay, so this is what's known as the homogeneous coordinates. So we, we're going to represent the line AX plus BY plus C as a triple of numbers, ABC, and with the understanding that any two triples that differ by a constant non-zero factor are the same line. So the line we've been talking about is 2, 1, minus 5. It's also 4, 2, minus 10, and minus 6, minus 3, 15, and so on. They all are the same line. These all represent the same thing. Okay, and now we're going to change our representation for points so that they work in the same way. So instead of representing a point by two numbers, we're going to represent a point by three numbers. Sometimes in mathematics it helps to make things more complicated if you can make them more symmetric. And here we're, we're making, the, we're, we're making the rep our representation of points more complicated but now they look more like the, rep they look the same as the representation of lines. So how are we going to do this? Uh, we're going to choose, represent a point, which is ordinarily called P and Q, by a triple, U, V, W, uh, as, and we're going to choose it so that U is P times W and Q is, uh, V is Q times W. So if you have a point 1, 3, then that is the point 1, 3, 1, and it's also the point 2, 6, 2, and it's also the point minus 3, 9, minus 3. We've multiplied this by uh, minus 3, or we can multiply this by a third and get 1 third minus 1, 1 third. So the, third, the final term here gives you the uh, constant you want to multiply by, and, the, uh, and then you multiply the first two the ordinary coordinates and you get the homogeneous representation. 
So again, any two triples that differ by a constant multiple are actually the same point. Okay, and now we can, now things work out very neatly in a certain sense because a point UVW lies on the point line ABC if A times U plus V, B times V plus C times W equals zero. But the proof, you've got to be careful about this, right? The original equation was A, uh, A times P plus B times Q plus C equals zero, but P is U over W and Q is V over W, so you get this equation here, multiply through by W, you get V. Okay, and now we can actually define homogeneous coordinates for the points, for points at infinity. Suppose we have a collection of parallel lines. Parallel lines differ in the constant terms. If you have 2x plus y minus 5 equals 0, and 2x plus y minus 7 equals 0, and 2x plus y plus 21 equals 0, those are parallel lines because obviously there's no way of solving for x and y and getting any valid solution. You have 2x plus y equals 5 and 2x plus y equals 7. They both can't be true. So, uh, so these are parallel lines. Okay, now I want to construct a point at infinity that lies on all of these. What does that mean? It means that 2 times, I'm going to construct a point which whose homogeneous coordinates are u, v, and w. And it lies on all of these. How is that going to work out? Well, one need to be the case that 2 times u plus v uh, minus c times w equals 0. Um, and so this is satisfiable if, um, and this has to be true for all c. Okay, so clearly w has to be 0 and v is equal to minus 2u and then it works out. So the point at infinity here is going to be minus 2, 1, 0, or 4 minus 2, 0. Those all represent the same point at infinity for the line x plus 2y minus 5 equals 0, because, uh, right, yes, because this equation is satisfied. Um, and of course the choice of 5 there is arbitrary since we're multiplying it by 0. Uh, so this homogeneous coordinate, this, this, this triple representing the point, lies on all of the lines x plus 2y minus any constant equals 0. Okay, so now we have homogeneous coordinates. We have a homogeneous coordinates for the point of infinity which tells us correctly whether the point of infinity lies at a line. And this makes sense, this is justifiable in the following sense. Suppose we consider points with homogeneous coordinates, with triple coordinates, and we move the third term down to zero. We keep the first two terms fixed and we move the third term down to zero. So minus two, one, one is just what you'll usually call is minus 2, 1. And minus 2, 0 0.1 is the point minus 20, 10. And minus 2, 1, 0 0.0001 is the point minus 20,000, 10,000, and so on. And we keep, we, as, we, as this number gets closer to 0, we keep moving out on this same line. And so therefore it makes sense that once we reach 0, it still lies on the line, just infinitely far out on the line. Now, the homogeneous, what about the line at infinity? It also needs homogeneous coordinates. Everything has to be nice and symmetric. Okay, well that's easy. Right, the, homo, the, the points on the line at infinity are the points of the forms u, v, and zero. Okay, so the homogeneous coordinates for the line of infinity our, all we have to do is make sure that a times u plus b times v plus 0 times c equals 0 for all of the values u and v. Uh, and so a and b have to be 0, c can be any non-zero value. Okay, so now 
we have the following very nice situation. A point in homoge a point is represented, point in the line and in the projected plane is represented by a triple x, y, z. They're not all equal to zero. We have the rule that if they differ across the board by a constant function, they represent the same point. And a point x, y, z lies on the line a, b, c if a, x plus b, y plus c, z equals zero. And vice versa, it's the same thing for lines. A line is a triple x, y, z, not all equal to zero. If these two are equal to zero, then it's the line at infinity, otherwise it's an ordinary line. Uh, and it has the rule that if you multiply through by a constant, you have the same line. And the line x, y, z contains the points a, b, c if this equation is satisfied. But now you will notice we have described lines and points in exactly the same way. Right? Our description of the relation between lines and points is exactly the same as our description of the relation of points and lines. And therefore, if you have a diagram of points and lines, you can replace every point with coordinates A, B, C with a line of coordinates A, B, C and vice versa, and you have a valid diagram. So that means we can do this to Pappus's theorem, for instance. We change all our points to lines and our lines to points, and we get, this, we get a new version of the theorem, uh, which is as follows. We're going to start with two points instead of two lines. We're going to draw, th through each point, we're going to draw three lines of three different colors. We're going to consider the intersection where two lines of the same uh, color meet. So here's the blue and the red line meeting. The, uh, here's, the, um, here are the, here's the blue and the red. Here's the blue and the red. Here's the blue and the green. Here's the blue and the green. Uh, here's, sorry, here's the blue and the green. Uh, what am I doing here? These are my original points. Here's the blue and the red, here's the blue and the red. Here's the blue and the green, here's the blue and the green. Uh, here's the red and the green. Here's the red and the green. And what Pappus's theorem in its dual form says is now if you draw the three lines connecting those pairs of points, they are coincident. They all meet at a point. Which they almost do. And just to show you how these dual forms work. In our original form, we, had, we start by drawing, drawing two lines with red, blue, and green points. In our dual form, we start with two points with red, blue, and green lines. In the original form, we drew the lines connecting points of different colors. In the dual form, we find the intersection of lines of different colors. In the original form, we found the intersections of the two uh, of, the, of, of the three combinations of lines of the same pairs. Uh, in the dual form, we reverse uh, lines with points and we draw the lines connecting the corresponding points. Our conclusion in the original form was that the points are collinear. Co and our conclusion here is that the lines are coincident. But it's the same theorem because lines are points and points are lines. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, I hope that was somewhat enjoyable and somewhat intelligible.